Jill, panelists, what do you think? Should we get started? We're, we're at about 200 people in our, our webinar. One more minute. One more minute, okay. There's still people coming in. Okay. Thanks everybody for joining us. We're just gonna you know, take another minute or so to allow folks to pop in. Just a note, as uh, as people are populating the the webinar, that, um, and I'll remind everyone again about this following the introduction, um, is that this evening we'll be using the Q and A function when we shift to the question and answer period following Justin, Jen, and Curry's presentation. And so we'd like, please, to ask our um, you know all the attendees to not use the chat function. Um, we we will be using the Q and A function this evening when we shift to the uh, to the question and answer period. Thanks, Osair. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Jill Stoner. I'm the director of the Israeli School of Architecture and Urbanism. While we're meeting on a virtual platform, whether from Ottawa, from some other Canadian province or territory, or from a country that goes by another name, we are all very likely on unceded ground. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the indigenous peoples of all places that we are living in today. Such acknowledgement is particularly relevant to those of us who shape the built environment, the agendas of which are almost always predicated on who owns or controls the land that is being shaped. Acknowledgement is the beginning of a much longer and more active project, aligning how we build with what we believe. Tonight's lecture is part of three streams of programming in our school this year. All three streams address design's relationship to social and spatial inequities perpetuated through colonial practices. In addition to the forum series in which there will be four lectures this winter, our school began a series of student initiated events in the fall under the umbrella title of Critical Intersections. These include various colloquia linked to courses and design studios, as well as more formal events like the forum lectures. Tonight's lecture is also Carlton's contribution to a pan-Canadian lecture series called Global Perspectives that began in September. In this series of 12 lectures, one is sponsored by each of the 12 schools of architecture across Canada. Like the forum lectures, these lectures are open to the public. The next Pan Canada lecture sponsored by University of Toronto is on January 26th. For more information on both of these series of events, we're putting links into the chat box so that you can look them up. Gathering a group of this size, and we're uh, well over 200, 225, from across many time zones uh, and lines of latitude on a digital platform is no easy feat. I wanna recognize and, and thank everyone from our school community who contributed to these efforts. In particular, Ellen Perry Sood, our administrative specialist, Mike Getz, our IT administrator, Maria Cook, our communications officer, and Gabrielle Argent, a recent graduate of our master's program, who is helping us choreograph our course delivery through several online platforms. I also want to thank our alumnus, Dave O'Malley, for designing this year's beautiful forum poster. A heartfelt welcome to all of you, students, faculty, members of the Ottawa community, friends and colleagues from near and far. It is now my pleasure to introduce adjunct professor John Cook, who has been teaching at our school for more than 35 years. John was an original sponsor of the forum lectures, and he generously agreed to take the lead in organizing this year's series. 
John, may I invite you to say a few words? Thanks, Jill. Um, I mean, I should just correct you. Our firm, uh, GRC Architects, was one of a group of firms that got together to sponsor the, lec the forum lectures. And really, all I would like to say is how special the forum series is because it's um, it brings the public and students and international architects together to talk about architecture. And it does so by doing it in a public place. Most of the forum series have taken place in the National Gallery, which places the architecture into a broad cultural context. It places it in the heart of the city. It means that anybody from the community can take part. And that's what the forum sponsors endowed the series for was so that it could be a totally public event and a public series. And so while it's unfortunate that this is um, not in person, it's wonderful that tonight there's going to be people here from all over the world and people are welcome from all over the world because that's the whole idea of the forum series is that it brings architecture into a public discussion. It's not just something that happens in the school of architecture like many lecture series happen. Um, you know, and the forum series started in the school in the what's known as the pit. Um, it was great, it was popular, but it was felt very important to um, many of us that it happened in the public sphere. And so that's really all I would like to highlight tonight. Um, there were, you know, a number of architects, IBI, Barry Hoban and ourselves, a um, number of builders, Trinity, uh, Charles Furt, um, Supply Company, Merkley Supply, that all, you know, got together and said, this is a great series and it should happen in public. So, you know, with that said, um, we'd like to get things started and we'll introduce uh, Ozerk Saluji, who's uh, an associate professor at the School of Architecture, Carleton, and he's the director of the master's program there. And he will talk to us a little bit about what we're going to hear and see and, and speak to tonight. Well, thank you, thank you, John. Um, just a reminder to everyone that at the conclusion of the lecture, when we shift to the Q&A, we'll use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And uh, please don't use the chat function for, uh, you know, uh, for the webinar. Um, hello and welcome from Ottawa, from the Israeli School of Architecture and Urbanism. Uh, my name is Ozer Saluji. I'm a faculty member here at the school. Uh, and I am a, a first generation settler of color. And my introduction tonight is spoken from the traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin nation. Um, I've lived for, for most of my life um, on Algonquin, Dakota and Ojibwe lands um, and on the lands and waters of communities who were subject to forced removals, uh, to genocide and to ethnic cleansing. Um, we face and live and contend with this legacy today from Standing Rock to the steps of the Senate chamber of the Capitol building in Washington, D.C., to our Canadian streets and cities and schools. Uh, and as a result, we have, I think, much learning and unlearning to do as part of our collective responsibilities to each other and to the lands and waters that we occupy um, and to the Indigenous First Nations and Métis communities where perhaps some of you are and where I am here in Ottawa tonight. Um, I hope that we now, and when we're able to gather safely with masks and social distancing and soon vaccines, and then with open arms and open hearts, that we'll continue uh, commit and recommit to the action, the showing up and the work of schooling and unschooling, of dismantling and rebuilding towards an ethic of collectivity, of justice, of accountability and of compassion. Uh, the work of learning and unlearning of schooling and unschooling together in a pluriverse of difference frames our lecture this evening. Uh, and I am so delighted and privileged to introduce Justin Garrett Moore. Uh, Justin is, as of December 2020, uh, the inaugural program officer for the Mellon Foundation's Humanities in Place program, where he will lead and oversee the initiative to bring plural voices, histories, stories, and narratives um, into more expansive media, museum, and memorial terrains and spaces. Um, he will work to co-shape and lead the Monument Project, which is a five-year quarter billion dollar commitment, that's billion with a B, uh, to reshape the commemorative landscape of the United States. And he was until this past December, the executive director of New York City's Public Design Commission. He has worked as a senior urban designer for over 10 years in New York City's Department of Planning. He's also adjunct faculty at Columbia 
uh, Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, where he also received his degrees in architecture and urban design. He is a member of the American Planning Association's AICP Commission, which is the American Institute of Certified Planners, uh, the Urban Design Forum, and serves on the board of IOBY, the acronym for In Our Backyards, Black Space, as well as the Youth Design Center. And he's also the co-founder um, of Urban Patch, a social enterprise that focuses on community development and design, which we'll hear a little about today. Um, and I met Justin recently uh, when we were thinking about how to engage at the school uh, with how we might take on a worthy curriculum, uh, contextualized by recent events and by the surfacing of the long, long histories of white supremacy, of settler colonialism, glaring inequity, and the grifts of privilege and wealth, which are on display seemingly everywhere and certainly here in our own front and backyards. Um, I met Justin uh, through the recently launched Dark Matter University which is a collective aimed uh, at working for immediate change to move us to anti-racist models of design education and practice. Uh, DMU is a transdisciplinary collaborative whose aim is to foster new forms of knowledge and knowledge production, to engender new institutions, to build new forms for collectivity and practice, new forms of culture and community, and new forms of design. Um, I have been constantly amazed at how much Justin does, gives, and commits to. Uh, and it was really through conversations with him and another DMU faculty member, Jennifer Newsom Carruthers, that our graduate option studios were shaped for this year. These courses started yesterday uh, and include two studios led by Dark Matter University faculty, one by Curry Hackett and Jalisa Bloomberg, and another by Killian Riano and Jen Lowe. Curry and Jen, who Justin will introduce, will join him this evening in conversation. Um, and so um, our intimacy and our distance to each other is palpable. We are learning through pandemics and politics, through masks and masquerades, through biological viruses, as well as social ones. Uh, Zoom magnifies distances and differences of all kinds, but it also shrinks and collectivizes as we're able to be here together this evening. Uh, it is a way of learning and unlearning. And we are so delighted and grateful to have Justin and Kari and Jen with us tonight. Please join me in a warm, if we can, Zoom welcome to Justin Garrettmore. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Jill, John, and Nozair, uh, and really to the entire Carleton uh, community for uh, opening uh, your, your university and your space for learning and sharing uh, uh, not only to myself, but to really the entire DMU uh, family and, and network. Uh, so uh, to start uh, this evening, we decided to call this, this conversation a uh, collective difference. So rather than uh, a simple lecture, we really want it to be a conversation and a dialogue among many ideas and thoughts, uh, not only from myself, uh, but also uh, Curry and Jen. And so uh, the, the format will be uh, sort of a, a, a different model where we'll uh, do self introductions briefly to, to you know, say hello. Uh, and then we're gonna have a couple conversations. First, uh, collectivism through cultural expression and one on uh, cooperative futures. These are actually the themes of the studios uh, that DMU is engaging in now at Carleton. And then we'll have an open discussion. Uh, so to start, uh, my name is Justin. I go by he, him, and I'm joining you from Lenape land, uh, now known as Harlem in New York City. I've had a non-traditional career in architecture and design, and as Ozair mentioned, I now work in philanthropy as an officer at the Mellon Foundation. My work crosses multiple sectors and fields, including education. I usually say that I care about people, places, and planet and I know that design is a great way to do so. I have practiced with collectives like Dark, uh, Dark Matter University and Black Space in order to build power. I also work to offer my support and care to the communities uh, that I'm connected to. But over the years, I've worked primarily in the public sector, crossing design, planning, policy, and even politics to realize transformative projects like Hunters Point South uh, in the video shown here, which is on east, uh, the East River waterfront in New York City. I've also worked in urban context through 
design, planning, and development through my social enterprise, Urban Patch, and I'll share some of that uh, in a bit. Uh, the project on the bottom right is an affordable housing uh, development project uh, that we did in uh, Kigali, Rwanda, that was focused on advancing uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. But the last kind of point of introduction that I, I wanted to make, and before I turn it over, is I wanted to give a, a shout out to Carleton faculty member Paul Karyok. Uh, so Paul was my professor many years ago, uh, you know, back when we still did everything by hand. Uh, his studio at, at the University of Florida at the time uh, had a huge influence in it, and it follows me to this day. Uh, so this image is a, a project uh, from his studio where I designed a new environment to mark the history of the slave trade in a public park in Savannah, Georgia. So just a few weeks ago, I began uh, sort of this new role leading a new place-based program focused on the connection between the design of spaces and social justice. And I, I just wanted to acknowledge that I really first uh, learned about this from Paul's studio over two, uh, 20 years ago. Uh, so it seems full circle. Um, with that, I'll hand things over to Curry. Hi everyone, I'm Curry. Um, you can um, go to the next slide. <laughs> Um, so I think to, to understand my entry point uh, into design uh, as a profession, um, public facing design in particular, I always like to reference my upbringing in Farmville, Virginia, uh, population, I think 8,000. Um, I grew up near my family farm, which is actually where this photo was taken. Um, and so, you know, I think before I even understood it in such terms, I think it's where I first enjoyed uh, what I would call a black landscape, um, which sort of provided a sense of agency and, and survival for my ancestors. Um, in 2008, however, I left Farmville to attend Howard in Washington, D.C. Um, and when I got to Howard, I think I really appreciated all the history that I grew up with, uh, even more because I recognized that uh, they were both of these kinds of Black landscapes. So, you know, Black people just unapologetically um, occupying a space that was built for and by Black people. Um, and, and so, you know, I think at Howard, there's this sort of Black exuberance and delight um, in times of, I guess, relative peace, and then this sort of pronounced sense of collectivism and solidarity during moments of maybe struggle or pain. Um, and about five years ago, I started my practice, Wayside Studio. Um, a lot of my, a lot of the work uh, that I do uh, is sort of, it exists in the public realm, um, it's sort of the spaces between uh, buildings, but also between people. Um, a wayside is the sort of land by a, ray, a, a road or a railroad track. Um, and so, you know, I think by encountering my projects from, from their marginal context, you know, I can shape approaches that maximize shared value. Um, so in this way, we can engage design as a means of uh, responding to socio-cultural and environmental issues. Um, and I'm also teaching um, the second year studio currently at um, my alma mater at Howard. And so through all of these roles and lenses, uh, I think I've become really fascinated by uh, opportunities to employ spatial treatment and public art as devices to foster networks between people and land uh, and, the, and the built environment, so. Hi everyone, um, I'm Jen Lowe. Um, I go by she, her, and I am a landscape architect and integrative designer. I live on the stolen land of the Piscataway people, also known as Washington, DC. Um, and I am actually sitting just uh, one and a half miles right now from the Capitol building. Um, so my work and research interests are really motivated by three sort of contexts. One is my background. Um, as a Chinese American woman, um, I grew up on the West Coast in Seattle, Washington in the suburbs. Um, but we spent most of our time in the International District in Seattle where we could buy our groceries um, and have lunch. And the majority of my uh, extended family actually um, uh, live in, uh, in Vancouver. So, and my uncle um, owned a restaurant um, in Vancouver's Chinatown. So growing up, I think my sort of initial observations and interest in the built environment was based on my observations and how people move through space and the differences of certain places um, in terms of um, disbelonging and belonging. Um, in particular, my parents, um, we grew up in a very predominantly um, uh, white suburban neighborhood and seeing the changes in their freedom of movement 
um, as we transected living and existing in Chinatown or the International District was fundamentally very different. And the, those contrasts um, were very, very visceral to me. Um, and my past practice, um, I also spent 12 years um, engrossed in sort of design research as it took place in um, uh, the physical and spatial forms of um, design research, but not really unpacking and interrogating the processes of people and who and um, belonged and who was invited to places or excluded from places. So I see my current praxis as like really looking at design, art, and the processes thereby as important and powerful tools. And they've been really successful in um, perpetuating and contributing to displacement, erasure, alienation, violence, and gentrification. So there's incredible power in how we can explore and use these same tools to, um, to counter and disconnect, to build wealth and equity and justice and resilience and place keeping where there hasn't been before. Great, thank you, uh, Curry and Jen. Uh, so we're first going to do a, a conversation uh, which is connected to uh, the For With studio at, at Carleton and have a conversation about collectivism through cultural uh, expression. All right, so um, I'm just going to go through a few projects um, that through my personal practice and, and some work um, that uh, I've explored with my students at Howard, um, sort of as a context or a pretext for the studio uh, at Carleton. But um, just beginning with this, this first one, this is the Howard Theater Walk of Fame in Washington, DC, um, where I'm based. Uh, it was completed in 2019, it was, uh, 2018. It was a city commission commemorative artwork um, in the Shaw neighborhood, which is the sort of um, Eastern anchor of DC's Black Broadway um, along U Street. Um, we honored 15 Black cultural icons, people like Marvin Gaye, Ella Fitzgerald, um, with this sort of tripartite system of uh, uh, hand-carved bronze medallions and some signage. Um, I, I think this project, really by definition, was about homage and honor and re remembrance of Black people, um, kind of creating a, a vibrant uh, cultural landscape uh, during a time that was especially hostile to Black bodies. And so I think, incidentally, all of this um, kind of took place in a, in a but, but it was it was interesting that all of this took place um, in an urban space that was really black owned and, and black built. Um, and so, uh, you know, actually this image on the left, which I love is, is one of my favorite parts to work on um, because that was where we got to really tell these 15 stories and, and help to bring the project off the ground um, and into memory. Um, and so, you know, I think uh, recognizing patterns and, and stories uh, within communities and celebrating them, uh, not simply as a means of legitimizing, but, uh, but also as a means of ownership. Um, and so uh, I think moving forward, um, as, I, as I continue to uh, interrogate my practice, just begin to ask like, how can we develop similar approaches for um, black and other marginalized designers? Or what does it mean? Um, you know, how can we find ways to, to look to latent and overlooked history as a means of revaluing and centering people's stories? Um, this next project um, uh, uh, was a, a recent exploration uh, in my second year studio at Howard, um, which is actually a modification of an assignment we did last year where we diagrammed Pete Mondrian's paintings um, before mapping them onto a sort of like 3D cubic uh, abstraction. Uh, this year, however, um, I thought it'd be uh, great to explore the, the G's Bend quilts um, that are um, made by uh, this community of Black women um, in, in G's Bend, uh, Alabama. Um, the, the quilts, um, some of them dating back to the 19th century, were these sort of intricately, intricately made from uh, scrap materials like denim and, and burlap sacks. Um, and so the abstraction that we got back from the students were, I think, actually extremely expressive, almost sort of Afrofuturey um, uh, responses to these artifacts. And I, 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 uh, I think I really appreciated how the students sort of embodied the ingenuity of these quilters. Um, as one of the first exercises that these students tackled this semester, I found that it was um, actually pretty useful that they began to understand the importance and value of, of Black aesthetic production, even at the, even at the abstract level. Um, this is a project from uh, earlier this uh, uh, last spring semester last year. Um, 
uh, where the studio was invited to sort of develop a proposal for on the 14th and U intersection, which is the Western end uh, sort of anchor uh, bookend of Black Broadway. Um, after a few weeks of some research, um, the students as a group uh, came back and you know, decided that this site would be fitting for uh, a pavilion for Black cultural expression. Um, and, and so, in, in fact, we ended up citing the six modes of uh, Black cultural expression that are on the African American Museum at the Smithsonian uh, on their website. Um, and so I think, you know, in my year plus year of teaching, um, I've learned a lot about practice and, and by testing out ways of encouraging the students to discover value, um, again, in Blackness as sort of as a plane of study um, and the subsequent uh, implications in the built realm. Um, but also the importance uh, of creating places for Black folks to, to gather in relative peace and dignity, um, because I think that's where the, the, the kind of collectivism uh, occurs and, and, and is maintained in, the, in those spaces. Um, the photo on the left was actually our site um, that was being activated this past summer during a Black Lives Matter march. So just kind of, it was interesting, um, but just a few short months after this project uh, was sort of a, an abstract exercise in studio. We, we understand the potential of these kinds of spaces uh, in the real world. Um, and then lastly, uh, this project from actually just last month, uh, Justin and Jen sat in on my review for this. Um, the, the group was invited to, the stu students were invited to research and, and uh, diagram a ritual of their choosing um, and uh, spatialize it as an intervention um, to be cited on Howard School of Divin uh, Divinity Campus. And so, um, you know, the students came back with uh, Black spirituals and storytelling, uh, various aspects of the Black church, African cosmology. Um, this student, uh, Bria Miller, decided to uh, research and diagram Junkanoo, uh, which is a Bahamian street festival. Um, this, the festival sort of aggregates uh, an array of, of families and communities into this giant parade um, and procession of costumes. And, and you can see how she sort of spatialized that here. Um, I'm reminded of Bell Hooks um, in, in Teaching to Transgress, uh, where she mentions uh, how, how we uh, sustain ourselves by building communities uh, and places where we're not alone, which uh, sort of by proxy become communities of resistance. And so I, I think through case studies like these, which explore gathering as a conduit for creative expression, we can come to understand the built realm as a substrate for learning and identity. Um, and interrogating what that means by celebrating, again, uh, underrecognized patterns. Um, this is the, the studio that um, we're, we just started yesterday, um, uh, the, the DMU uh, option studio with, that I'm co-teaching with Jalisa Bloomberg. Um, it's called Four With, an individual practice towards collective expression. Um, and so this studio uh, is sort of a, a, a reification of all of the, an, an amalgamation of all of these themes I discussed earlier. Um, for with um, sort of legitimizes uh, black modes of collectivism um, by, uh, you know, re and recentering black study as a, a, a viable subject matter um, in academia at large, but, you know, specifically like in developing program and urban schema. Um, so we'll be looking at gospel music and Houston car culture and regional social dance, Afro-Latina performance, um, and, and distilling all of those um, uh, into their primary modes of gathering and expression. Um, and the studio, as the name might suggest, sort of reinforces this notion that uh, these practices, um, which we're calling artifacts, are predicated on both individual and collective contribution. And so there's a lot of you know, intergenerational and intermodal respect between these group practices. Um, yesterday, we started by um, unpacking these uh, actually quite different artifacts um, individually. So we have 12 students, each one picked uh, 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 an artifact um, and they'll, they'll analyze those um, individually. But as we move on, we'll start to kind of draw um, common threads um, between them and begin to discover um, evidence of, of cultural mutations and similarities as a result of the year American slave trade. Um, and so eventually we'll, cons we'll consolidate all these solo efforts into groups uh, with each group acting sort of as a different uh, moderator in, in a collective effort. Um, and we'll, we're really excited about this, uh, the final phase of this, which is shaping up to be um, what we, what Delisa and I think will be a really cool feature of the studio 
um, is the sort of interrogation of the, the relevance of these modes of collectivism by mapping them onto uh, an actual real world project um, in the predominantly black city of Cleveland, Ohio. Um, and so, we, you know, we're working with some, some community partners we have on the ground there. Um, uh, uh, um, there's a multilateral, multilateral effort to uh, redevelop the streetscape along East 66th Street um, in the Huff neighborhood. And uh, Adam Drew King, uh, the guy there on the right, um, is, a, is a creative technologist and, and is working on a system of uh, what he's calling smart parks uh, in the Huff neighborhood. So he's actually kind of um, bringing um, a, a hub of uh, Wi Fi connectivity. Um, and so, you know, I think in examining this area, we hope to be able to arrive at a speculative suite of, of new spatial treatments, uh, which are both informed by, but also prioritize the methods that we discussed earlier in the studio. And so, you know, ultimately I hope um, that this format and through this kind of black study, um, we can interrogate ways of maybe deterring disproportionate um, individual contribution um, while also encouraging responses which foment collective voices and celebrate interpersonal um, and collective exchange. Um, and so, you know, I think uh, looking at um, how all of these communities kind of co-produce in ways that uh, critique the rigidity of prevailing power dynamics and are more concerned with co-authorship instead of ego or with ego and saviorism. And so all of these, all of these work, all of this work and these thoughts um, uh, are to investigate what happens when we reframe community and collectivism as the sort of primary module um, and, and getting away from spaces and strategies that police and discourage um, and, and instead sort of questioning our role as designers um, in ways that foster spaces that empower, uh, 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 empower communities and, and foment strong, uh, meaningful connections to the landscape. Um, and so I think all of these, you know, uh, sort of in concert will engender the uh, spatial imaginaries that we talk about, you know, to talk about um, the environment, to talk about economics and education and, and, and uh, land management and housing um, is to talk about the social infrastructures and, and the stories and fictions um, and histories that support them. So um, that about wraps it up for me for this part. Great, uh, thank you, Curry. I'm really excited to see uh, what comes of, of the studio and of course, uh, to, to see what comes of your own work uh, professionally uh, as a designer as well. Uh, so, you know, put it sort of in dialogue with, with uh, this, this concept of uh, collectivism through cultural expression. I wanted to introduce one of the ways that, that I practice collectivism and cultural expression uh, through my involvement in an organization called uh, Black Space. Uh, so Black Space is a collective of architects, designers, uh, planners, artists, uh, general urbanists, uh, who are focused on the work that is needed in uh, Black and Brown communities uh, really across uh, the country. And so Black Space demands a present and future where Black people, Black spaces, and Black culture matter and thrive. And we believe that futures will be manifested through the creative possibilities of asset-based thinking, not traditional deficit-focused practices. And I think a lot of the work that Curry just shared uh, is very much along these lines. And so one of the, the sort of initial products that we developed as Black Space was our Black Space Manifesto. So these are ideas and principles that we uh, put together uh, both within our organization, but also working in and with Black communities uh, to really address the, the uh, poor patterns and, and uh, sort of practices that existed in how communities were changing. So some of these are, are sort of objectives about how we work. So for example, creating circles, not lines, right? Tonight's conversation is actually a version of that. You're hearing uh, three voices and not one or move at the speed of trust, sort of acknowledging that uh, work sometimes needs uh, sort of time to build trust and responsibility before you advance work. Or another important one, and, and one that I think a, a lot of people have, have uh, become uh, more aware of in the past year, which is to reckon with the past in order to build the future, right? So much of, of the social and environmental and uh, economic issues are things that have been uh, in place for a long time and we have to do 
the hard work of addressing that before uh, we move into the future. And finally, one of my favorites says to celebrate, catalyze, and amplify Black joy. Uh, you know, we can't always be in sort of places of, of harm uh, or, or concern and that it's important uh, uh, to remember joy. And finally, that as designers, we must seek to manifest the future through our work. And so with Black Space, there are a number of different prompts or questions like, what is it that we're designing actually, right? Not everything is always a, a building. And so uh, we've had conversations about that, right? There's the need to design uh, leadership, especially with the lack of, of access and power and agency, particularly for people of color in certain spaces, uh, the ability to design leadership is key. Uh, the ability to design spaces and experiences Right, to have that ability to kind of create spaces of, of comfort and connection uh, and sharing. And something that Ozair mentioned, uh, the sort of the ability to design our learning, right? So thinking about how we have a, a more complete space for learning and to sort of press and challenge on uh, some of the things that, that we need to learn and unlearn in our work. And finally, you know, ultimately as designers, we're, we're all connected to our communities and places. And so we wanna create ways to, to create sort of strategies for our communities and neighborhoods and where people can be uh, sort of active participants and, uh, and sort of build power and knowledge and awareness in their work. And so we've done a lot of work and another sort of thing that we needed to immediately design was to sort of get the, the word out, right? So the manifesto, uh, is a version of that and something to uh, say is that it's uh, sort of completely black design uh, led. So black graphic designer, black print shop, print everything. Uh, but the idea of sort of publishing this content, sort of creating uh, new knowledge and, and generating uh, sort of a different canon, if you will, is something that we've been doing. And so the purpose of this is to create sort of, uh, you know, tools and strategies and, and work that, that can be uh, sort of given over to and developed uh, uh, in communities so that people can do their own work. And so we started by uh, seeking to uh, sort of center lived experience, right? Sort of taking the designer and, and figuring out what are our other responsibilities? What are our concerns and cares and how do we do our work, right? So doing things like listening, uh, doing things like activating spaces and, and uh, creating an environment where you can learn by doing with people instead of uh, apart from people. Uh, or by sort of uh, co-creating and, and co-designing uh, sort of with local and cultural uh, producers, right? Uh, so that's a way to kind of elevate and value uh, what people uh, already know and already do uh, in a plane and, and sort of challenging one's own expertise. And of course, the idea of storytelling, I think uh, sort of Curry uh, mentioned this, you know, the idea of, of uh, elevating the stories and providing opportunities can be done in ways that are interactive and inclusive or in ways that uh, are documented. This is uh, where we worked with uh, neighborhood griots and writers to, to produce uh, a publication actually in our work. And so, you know, these are all prompts and ways of working and something that we're designing in, as an organization and, and way of being. But so what is black space though, really, when we talk about uh, our role as designers in, in the built environment? Black space is everywhere because black people are everywhere. Black space is joy. Black space is legacy. Black space is past. Black space is rooted. Black space is present. Black space is timeless. Black space is liberated. Black space is healing. Black space is ancient. Black space is future. We are a collective of designers invested in improving the way that community development happens in neighborhoods. Our manifesto centers inclusion and uplifts the power of dialogue. We believe that residents are the experts of the spaces they occupy. We believe in the practice of listening deeply and accepting criticism and catalyzing black joy. Right, so what is black space? All of these things, right, it's all of it. And the idea of, of sort of catalyzing black joy is uh, something that, that we can do and challenge 
ourselves as designers. So an example that I have, sort of a tangible example I have is uh, work that I've done uh, in the Brooklyn Cultural District, uh, which is in downtown Brooklyn in New York City. Uh, that image is pre-pandemic, obviously. It's uh, from something called the Dance Africa Festival, one of the sort of signature events for the black community in the city. But that part of the city was seeing rapid change uh, and frankly, gentrification. Uh, rezoning uh, initiatives led to new high rise uh, development, uh, including this project called 300 Ashland. Uh, 10 Architectos, along with Andrea Still, were the, the architects for this project. And so my role in that work was to really uh, sort of challenge kind of as this space was going to change and transform, how was the Black community going to be able to still be connected to and a part of this space? And so in, in my role as an urban designer, so many of our conversations were about the design of sort of carving out space for the public, carving out space to keep place, uh, carving out space for activity and continued culture and heritage. And so we developed that and, and uh, sort of created this uh, new public plaza that is sort of designed in a way to be adaptive to multiple subjectivities and multiple activities. And so this sort of a rendering of kind of illustrating that concept coming from the mind of, of the designer, but making sure that through our processes, through how we work, through inclusive uh, ways of engaging and, and having participation throughout the design process, we're able to make the rendering uh, reality and to create, uh, along with new development, new urban spaces that uh, center uh, the, the people that normally would have been displaced or removed and that despite uh, this new development, we still have after construction a place that is centered and valuable and comfortable uh, for Black people and for And so, you know, creating and generating these spaces is something that we have to take responsibility is for designers, not only how you design it, but kind of what your process is. How do we design for inclusion and create these spaces? And that by doing that, we can actually uh, produce spaces for Black joy. Um, and so with that, uh, we're going to turn it over to conversation and uh, Jen is going uh, to join uh, for us to uh, have a, a dialogue. Yes, so thank you so much, Justin and Curry. Um, first, Justin, I would just say that the Black Space Manifesto has been such a, a significant sort of framework for my own work and my research, um, just going to grad school the past couple of years. So um, super, um, yeah, thankful. <laughs> for what uh, that team has developed um, and your team has developed. I wanted to ask you both. So I think there's really rich through lines amongst your collection of work together. And I want to sort of unpack sort of the concepts and the relationship between collectivism and also individual expression, right? Because they can also be in sort of like, you know, conflict, but I think what's really beautiful about each of the, the projects and the programs and initiatives that you both do, they, they complement and they reinforce each other. Can you kind of expand on how to keep that and maintain that in your work? Sure, I mean, I'll, I'll start and I have, I, I definitely want to prod Curry on, on the famous cube because I think, <laughs> I think the answer is in that cube project. Um, you know, in, in this work, there's, there's the difficult work of, of being able to communicate with people, right? And to have understanding and empathy. And so, so much of, of this work, whether it's uh, kind of in a collective within a group of five or 10 or 50 people, or whether it's public work, like true public work, that you're responsible to everyone, that you have to understand that, that change is difficult, that creating is difficult, that using your energy and resources are, is difficult. And very often the answer is time. <laughs> uh, uh, to, to be able to kind of navigate and, and 
to manage that because uh, as we're sort of using our different modes of communication and, and sort of understanding and all of that, uh, typically we, we simply just need time uh, uh, to do that and, and for it to happen. Um, with the, the question of, of individual expression, I think is one that we, we have to uh, sort of confront a, a lot of the, the ways that, that we've sort of learned and, and been trained and conditioned to value some modes of, of expression or craft or uh, uh, even precision uh, uh, differently and, and through what have been, you know, European and, and Western dominated uh, uh, sort of paradigms. Uh, so that it, it's challenged, but that's work that I think we're more and more collectively seeing people pushing and challenging and doing the work to elevate uh, uh, individual expression, to elevate other uh, modes of, of thinking and creating and being. Yeah, I mean, I, I think all of that is is like super, super on point. I mean, I think about um, even sort of in the context of our studio, um, you know, I think a lot of it is, um, it, 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 Justin, you used the phrase uh, that I really liked, um, uh, sort of creating, uh, what was it? Maybe like kind of like carving out space to create place, mm -hmm. um, but, but even to like maintain the sense of place, right? And so like, I think doing that at the individual level is actually just important as the collective at the, at the collective scale and, and maybe um, kind of creating space and tools um, where maybe people feel empowered to kind of bring their own individual voice um, to a larger stage, I think, um, is a big part of that. You know, I think um, when, uh, um, when we, uh, I mean, we think about like graffiti, so like a deviant uh, sort of activity, like 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 graffiti that maybe seems like a sort of like an individual um, um, effort. Um, <laughs> how, I guess the flip side is like, how do you um, sort of maintain uh, a sense of identity? Um, sorry, I'm, I'm rambling a little bit, but I'm I'm just wondering like, how do how do we kind of create um, a, a sense of community? Uh, sorry, I lost lost my sense of thought. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, well, the graffiti right. comment is actually really interesting. It reminds me of, uh, you know, this past summer during the, the uh, protests, Black Lives Matter, uh, there are these street murals that were done kind of all over the country, sort yeah. of the mural of uh, Oliver One being first kind of by the city, by the person in power. Uh, one of the ones here in New York, uh, we actually worked with tax crew, with sort of a co yeah. collective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. um, graffiti artists right. uh, and the the kind of the interaction and, and dialogue and exchange between uh, the sort of the graffiti artists that have this layer of, of sort of commercial production, frankly, right. with um, uh, these artists that have been sort of uh, curated, frankly, uh, to, to talk about the moment that we were in. So right. making sure we had uh, queer and uh, people from different faiths and backgrounds in dialogue with what it meant to sort of create and claim space um, and, and using all of the different sort of tools uh, that, that we either know or don't know or actually right. uh, reproductive together. Right, exactly. You know, I think kind of recentering those so that a lot of this like marginal, I guess that's kind of what I was trying to get at, um, like recentering these sort of marginal activity, this deviant activity, and then, you know, making sure again that we, that we, Sort of in the literal sense, recenter that, but like really, the first step is like legitimizing that. Right. Um, and I think Justin, like you were saying earlier, I think that you know it's it's hard to do. I think the the the, the animating sort of agent there is uh, is actually time. You know, time maybe begin begins understanding. There's um a thing that we said a lot in my MDES integrative design experience is we're creating preconditions. <laughs> so a lot of these different interventions, right? You're kind of laying a certain sort of instrument to like cultivate this space and that has spatial sort of implications, relational implications, interpersonal. So it's all, it's all interconnected. Yeah. Um, another question, um, as we segue in sort of the, the cooperative segment of the, the conversation, like what do you think are the spatial implications of collectivism? 
Like, mm. are, are, is, are we seeing things differently or are these taking form in a different way? I mean, I think um, I keep, I keep, you know, my, the, our studio is like the forefront of my mind now. So like I, I keep drawing from, from different anecdotes, but, um, you know, I think right now we're actually in a moment of, of sort of challenging um, and co-opting. And so um, it, it, you know, I, I, it's kind of creating these, um, even kind of uh, bringing in certain notions, some notes from the last, uh, the last question, um, sort of recentering uh, even spaces that maybe seem marginal, right? And kind of shedding light on those spaces, inviting people to those spaces, um, not as a way of sort of taking up space, but just like saying like, hey, like if this, pl this place um, where this maybe sort of deviant activity occurs, like let's bring some lighting here, um, or let's bring, let's, let's bring um, you know, heating or, 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 or um, uh, shade to this area. Um, and so I think a, a lot of it, I and mean, I think there's a lot of actually, now there's a lot of opportunity to kind of redress um, the areas that maybe um, where people tend to kind of collect uh, sort of organically and, and in a sort of self-selected way. Um, I, I, and I think it's gonna be really telling, I think as the, as the practice kind of shifts um, towards this sort of climate of, uh, of redressing and editing um, as we kind of work to recenter the, you know, these, these maybe marginal, these marginal groups. Right. Yeah, th I think uh, this past year, there's been such proof of concept <laughs> for this whole yeah. idea yeah, of the yeah. uh, and in <laughs> every horrible way possible <laughs> uh, and, and positive way as well. But you know the the pandemic especially has has shown us this sort of idea of, of connectedness and responsibility and, and collective right the you know wear wear a mask uh, you know yeah. sort of simple things but what's really interesting and I think for for the design community especially is that I think in in a, a way that hasn't happened during M forty one during my lifetime is people's awareness of space. And connected to that, their awareness of kind of shared and public and common space yeah. is at a, a level that just we haven't had, at, at least in, in the American slash North American context because of our direct impacts, whether that's in a public health way or uh, with some of these conversations around uh, public safety, policing, protest, enforcement, et cetera. And so I, don't, I haven't been to, to Ottawa. I'm going to get there one of these days, but um, you know, here in New York, the transformation of our public realm in this time to, to sort of think more directly about, well, how are we collectively using our spaces, right? Should it be for the parking of private cars <laughs> or should it be, you know, to help people get access to services or right. to be able to go for a walk? Uh, and, and so I think designers can and, and really have to be uh, sort of a part of these conversations to help us illustrate, to help us kind of imagine what, what our collective conditions are and what they look like. Uh, and as we're doing that work, since it's happening anyway, that there are some other things that we can start talking about redesigning, right? Yeah. Um, you know, in, in New York, there's this sort of... Um, taking over of public space by private enterprise that I have some concerns about. And, uh, you know, architects may be helping to, to sort of problem solve for some of those questions about public versus private, uh, who has access, uh, who builds your architecture, who is the city for, uh, are part of it. Yeah. Um, awesome. I, I do think we need to move on to our yep. next um, topic, but thank you so much, um, uh, Curry. It's um, I, I love the dialogue, and I'm looking forward to, to continuing uh, in, engagement in, in the studio. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so our next uh, sort of thread of, of conversation is to talk about uh, cooperative futures, uh, and so we'll start off with with Jen. Thanks, Justin. Um, so Cooperative Futures, um, this is a studio um, I'm co-teaching with uh, Killian Riano. 
Um, the studio looks at how cooperative and collectivized econo economic and governance models help reshape the urban landscapes, architectures, and um, urban spaces and communities of color. We will explore concepts in community wealth building, democratic economies, and housing cooperatives, and provide a spatial vision of what increased cooperation could look like situated in site and space. Next slide. So we reside in the Huff neighborhood in Cleveland, Ohio. So we are in direct connection to Curry and Jaleesa's studio that is happening right now. Um, and we're building off a, a large sort of collection of ongoing work in this neighborhood or around this neighborhood. So, uh, and Killiam is really has been integral and been developing this work in collaboration um, with Cleveland owns, um, including Adam Drew King that Curry just mentioned, Mordecai Cargill and Jonathan Wells. Um, so, um, and you may have, uh, uh, Killian is also um, a part of the, the Carleton community. So I think you all are probably well familiar with his work. So in the spirit of the cooperative theme and taking advantage of our increased network within our virtual learning environments, um, we're gonna be building these co-learning exchanges amongst our students, our community partners, um, uh, module the module one DNU studio um, and then Killian also has a corresponding semester long studio so we'll ho hopefully have some intersection with the Kent State students as well. Um, and first, as I kind of wrap our heads around the idea now for going from a uh, collectivism uh, and collectivity to cooperation and cooperative systems and i'm going sort of. Uh, in sort of a similar like structure and framework and how we're going to go sort of approach our studio um, this semester, which is going at sort of the individual interpersonal scales of how we embody cooperative systems and cooperation. Um, and then I'm hopefully trying to make a nice transition into Justin's sort of segment also of expanding the notions of cooperation and cooperatives um, in sort of like broader context and larger systems. Um, and so I, I give you sort of like one th um, project, um, a part of my work, I'm a deputy director um, and, and lead the placekeeping initiatives in DC's Chinatown. Um, and this participatory art project was um, a, a critique on participatory planning practices as, um, as practiced by uh, city planning officials in Washington, DC specifically. Next slide. You can go to the next slide too. So Dear Chinatown DC was um, very much um, a, a critique about sort of these constrained checked off lists of, um, of a typical public engagement, public engagement processes, <laughs> right? Um, holding meetings, holding forums. And so I was just trying to interrogate that by bringing something very joyful so creating this pop-up installation during the Lunar New Year last year, how can we make something that's proactive instead of reactive, adaptable? This was a mobile sort of installation um, and making the neighborhood assets tangible and visual and then going to where the people are at. We literally just took over sort of like the, the street front in front of the Wallet House, which is an affordable housing building or just the remaining um, some older um, senior residents and longtime residents of Chinatown live today. Um, so this is about trying to activate and create a cooperative system of like all these different parties. Um, we have longtime residents, community leaders, we had the Smithsonian um, Anacostia Community Museum creating a little mini exhibit for us. We brought poster making, we had conversations. Next slide. So it's trying to also uh, sort of see like, oh, oh, I can't enjoy, like engagement should be joyful. It should be something that is sort of inherently human experiences. Um, so we create posters with people um, thinking about creating love letters to this neighborhood. Next slide. And this is the picture of, of that mini museum. We had a little um, oral history station as well. So we had, probably a collection of five or six different sort of institutions within Washington, DC. I don't typically sort of like integrate um, that we're able to kind of bring something very like spontaneous and very quick um, and fun to that to that day that hadn't been there before. 
Next slide. And there's results that come from this too. So like all of these quantitative measures that uh, city planning officials, like how many meetings, how many people, um, I mean, for us, we produce 84 posters sitting out there for six hours. We had conversations with like about five to six residents that we would never have interfaced before because they just don't have the mechanisms to get to meetings, to be able to engage or have the, uh, or have sort of similar language to be able to hold those conversations. Um, so I mean, those are those were incredible outcomes just from having something that was, um, yeah, to create an experience instead of um, creating a meeting. Next slide. Um, so that was cooperation at sort of the group and in, in institutional level. Um, and then at the urban studio, we look at sort of how can we design for cooperative systems. So. Um, our core values are design is liberation, authentic and meaningful engagement, the co-design and co-creation process being central to that with communities of color, um, intergenerational leadership, mentorship and exchange, and really centering also experts of lived experience. So to go on to sort of the conversation that we just had and Justin mentioning, um, like what if our projects are not physical, right? Like is, what, <laughs> Do we have some sort of existential crisis because of that? Um, next slide. Um, and uh, they don't have to work sort of in silos, right? They, they're all interconnected. You're building sort of systems, infrastructure, building up people and movements and creating beautiful places. And those are all should be sort of um, it, sort of work and connected together. So in the Middle Branch project in South Baltimore, Maryland, um, the urban studio has been sort of integrated into a team that has sort of evolved and changed over this years. And this whole master planning effort is sort of a decades long sort of um, uh, strategic planning effort with a lot of uh, ups and downs and a lot of also distrust built in the system of often, you know, strategic plans um, being sort of shelved um, and then re reinvigorated, but with kind of the same old motions. So us as landscape architects, um, we are building as part of this, um, as this master planning effort, um, a design lab for youth engagement. So like what it is to like redefine notions and scopes of work that call for engagement. Um, so you're creating sort of more uh, sustained and sustained models of, um, engagement, like creating like true equitable partnerships. So next slide. Um, so this, through this project, we're creating a, a community source design lab. Like, so they're going to get their report. They're going to get their master plan documents. But in the course of this nine month exercise, we also are building and executing and documenting and evaluating a youth led design lab where they're going to bring their own selves to the process and have the incubator space. So if you have looking at the energy coming from a, a initiative like a master planning process where there's tons of resources, tons of people right there at critical mass, how can we leverage all of that energy, all of that power to build something else that can be seen, sustained in perpetuity long after designers sort of leave the table? All right, um, thank you, Jen. We really love seeing the work and just want to put a pin in something that, you know, by intention and design, do we have the, the sort of multiple disciplines of design represented uh, to bring uh, landscape architecture, design and design strategy into our conversations because there are just many blind spots that we have as, as architects or even uh, uh, urban designers and urbanists. Um, so in many ways, my kind of prompt and, and thread for this uh, sort of uh, cooperative uh, uh, thought is that Dark Matter University itself, this is our sort of ambiguous <laughs> logo. Um, and and the, the idea is that there are ways that we're all connected uh, uh, in this work, in this world, uh, and that, you know, DMU itself is, is a mode of creating uh, cooperative futures, right? This is how even the three of us presenting to you were, were sort of connected and are now working uh, cooperatively. So as Eric had mentioned, um, you know, we, we have this sort of mission that looks at new forms of knowledge and knowledge production, 
new forms of institutions and power, new forms of collectivity and practice, new forms of community and culture, and new forms of design. And the, the, the notion of collectivity, of cooperative, of community or something that uh, we're in the process of, of kind of learning and designing and relearning ourselves. But in this effort, in this work, and maybe as a product of this time and Zoom and lots of different things, right, we've been able to, to have numbers, right? We've been able to sort of collect the pieces and elements and, and try to, to create something larger, right? There's, there's a very real thing called burnout and uh, stress and all of that. And so the ability to sort of work uh, in collective allows us to amplify and work across multiple universities, uh, you know, with hundreds of people to actually share labor and time and, and to co-create. And to really acknowledge that that you know we're we're a multitude. There are ways that we connect people, and now we have sort of a a, a different body uh, in a way. And, and it's important to kind of uh, think about that, and that we're also uh, kind of the multitude in our diversity, not just by our demographics as Black, Indigenous, and people of color, but uh, by the things that we do, whether that's uh, design writing or civic engagement or architecture or landscape and environmental design. But mostly what I really wanted to share uh, was uh, my sort of own prompt and thread into this question of, of uh, cooperative and collective practice. And so, you know, this is an architecture audience, architecture school, and one of the things that I always had a big gripe with our field is that uh, we just learn about a lot of white stuff. I mean, it just gets so old and so dead and so tired. Uh, and so uh, over the years, I've done some work in research to, to learn different histories and a different background. And so I'm gonna share some of that with you. Um, so I have a, an organization with my family. So it's a little co-op, it's a little LLC corporation, but it's a co-op, it's a little family cooperative called Urban Patch. And it began as a family history uh, a sort of initiative and project. And so this is a, a document that I found uh, from a black organization in Indianapolis where I'm from originally called the Flanner House. Uh, so this was a statement, but it was also kind of a manifesto. I showed the Black Space Manifesto. This is uh, black people in, in the 1940s and 1950s manifesto. Uh, so it states, what is it about? About people, about their needs, their abilities the land they live on, the land they till, the food they grow, about the cities they live in. And then it goes on to say, it's about what people know and don't know and what they ought to know, ought to know to help make America still greater, right? So for those of you that know what's going on in the US right now, this, this concept of the, the betterment, right? The more perfectness, of, of America is, is a project. <laughs> We're not doing so good on this group project right now, but um, you know, this idea that these black leaders were already sort of entering that conversation. And so this gentleman is named Albert Allen Moore and he was my uh, grandfather. And so he was one of the leaders working at Flanner House and he was their uh, agricultural uh, director. And what Albert Moore did is he led an operation of over 100 acres of, of community farms and, and backyard gardens uh, that were used to produce food for hundreds of families in a predominantly black and low income neighborhood. And through these programs that were all set up as cooperatives, they were able to provide jobs and opportunities for people like uh, veterans uh, returning from the war or young people who needed to provide uh, assistance for their families. But they did such interesting work because as a cooperative, they understood all the different sort of people and skills and needs uh, that were there and, and did things like create a cannery. Once they had, they grew a lot of food and a lot of it was rotting. And so they were like, well, we need to build a cannery and, and providing more opportunities for people. Or they even built a community center that had a, a demonstration kitchen. They had all this food and people didn't know how to cook it. Uh, so they literally designed and created a space uh, to, to help people learn how to cook food, right? So the idea of kind of learning and knowledge uh, is spatial and they kind of understood that importance of, of place and design. 
But this group was really amazing in that, uh, again, this is in like kind of the, the 1950s in Indiana, which we call the middle finger of the South, uh, sort of Klan country. Uh, you know, the idea of black people sort of having their own uh, sort of determined uh, notion for a community in space was difficult. Uh, but they, they were smart. Uh, the image at the left is a sociograph. So they went and they talked to all the different families in the communities and they understood who was connected to who and where the resources and agency and, and power were, but also where people uh, really had the need. And having done this work of having designed these systems of their community, they were able to get some key people together to come uh, together and to create uh, a plan for the redevelopment of their own neighborhood called the Fall Creek Homes. Uh, so this drawing is, is sort of their, their plan and, and kind of the figures and numbers where they're working it all out. Uh, and it was one of the largest uh, self-help housing construction development uh, initiatives uh, in the United States at the time. Uh, so they're doing this long before Habitat for Humanity, but they created a business model that kind of has the family at the center, uh, but the idea is that there's a cooperative that goes and feeds uh, itself. And so the families would volunteer uh, their, their time and labor kind of for the collective working to build the homes uh, in order for people uh, to, to uh, be able to, to have these houses. And so this is a, a whole neighborhood that was collectively planned, designed and built by black people. Uh, Hilliard Robinson, for those of you who don't know, is a prominent black architect, uh, was the architect that designed the kind of the test models uh, for these homes. And so this is a short video. Planet House is a red feather agency with a half century record of helping people help themselves through community projects and fundamental education. As a project in self-help home building, it provided leadership in establishing Planner House Homes, a corporation which furnishes capital, voluntarily subscribed by leading citizens, to enable families to build their own homes. Each family is chosen on the basis of good health, personal responsibility, family civility, and the ability to work with others. The head of each family puts in a minimum of 20 hours a week on the home building project in which he's participating. When Anne has worked the required number of hours and his house is completed, he obtains a mortgage loan from a local financial institution. His labor provides the equity. The proceeds from the mortgage loan go to Flanner House Homes as a payment for the land and material used in construction. Right. So, you know, this is from a kind of, a kind of a time capsule of Black leadership, Black ownership, Black cooperatives that are designing and transforming space in the city. So this image, uh, the area outlined in red was the, the Fall Creek Homes area, the area outlined in orange uh, was the Lockfield Gardens uh, housing development. This was uh, one of the early uh, public housing developments that was designed for segregation uh, in the United States. And so with the Fall Creek Homes, they were able to build out this community that included a park, a community center, uh, and all these self-built homes that provided a way for them, for the people to translate their equity, to tra or translate their labor and their time uh, into equity and value. And so what's very interesting is that when you fast forward to today, uh, that community still exists. It's the only affordable and majority minority community still in downtown Indianapolis. Everywhere else has either been lost to urban renewal or gentrified. Uh, even the public housing development uh, obviously had a lot of problems that a lot of public housing developments had and uh, was partially demolished. So it's important to kind of learn from, from these histories that, you know, I didn't learn in school. I learned a lot about what Corbusier cared about, but I didn't learn anything about these other models for how we design and plan our cities, right? So think about that when you're in your courses and who are you talking about? There's a lot of information that you were probably missing and it's worth investigating whether you're a student or a faculty member. Um, so what am I doing with this work? Uh, so fast forward to today, I'm sort of inspired by that. And as I mentioned, got together with my family. It was like, you know, grandpa was really cool. 
we should do that, but we're not as ambitious to do what he did. And so we did our little mini version, which is Urban Patch, which is simply we take um, uh, vacant buildings, vacant homes and vacant lots in the community where I grew up, which is a predominantly black community. And we do work to improve them uh, for community use and benefit. So things like a vacant uh, home, long vacant home uh, under foreclosure uh, that we simply fixed up and now provide it as affordable housing, uh, which wasn't so easy to actually do it. So that all the architects will know how hard this actually was. Uh, we're looking at the large amounts of, of vacant space. So kind of the legacies of things like redlining uh, kind of lead to conditions like this with high degrees of vacancy and demolition and disinvestment and working with people in the community to uh, sort of transform and improve uh, those spaces and to do that in a way that is involved and engaged with, with uh, sort of the, the people that are typically marginalized uh, like students from a nearby uh, high school uh, were able to sort of help design and, and install uh, the mural that now is sort of seen as a place of pride. Kind of a funny joke is when the, the mayor was running, he uh, did a, a photo op in front of the mural. He was like, you had nothing to do with this. But, you know, that's how it goes. Um, but, you know, we're looking at all the things that, that our sort of our ancestors did and learned and, and talked about kind of ways to get people that live in the neighborhood to uh, sort of uh, have uh, sort of opportunity to use their skills and labor so that when we're doing our work that we're making sure that the money is circulating within the community. Um, we have the same problems they have. We did these big community garden and there was all this food rotting. And so we had to sort of create a, a canning uh, program. And the idea that we're getting all these different sort of demographics of people that are in the neighborhood now are able to actually connect uh, through this common element of food. Um, finally, we were able to do uh, this great um, sort of project, which was uh, to bring back my grandfather's uh, legacy. So mentioned he ran sort of the whole urban agriculture program, but one of the things that he also ran was uh, a cooperative grocery store. Uh, and obviously after a number of years uh, uh, that grocery had closed. And so we worked with people um, uh, in the neighborhood to uh, sort of bring back the idea of a food access point uh, and it's called Cleo's uh, Bodega. Cleo Blackburn was the leader of, of the Flanner House, but my grandfather is there as well. And now there is a, a place, a real place, doing real things uh, that the community needs. Uh, so fresh food, um, grocery, uh, but also a small cafe uh, for people that has created this new uh, sort of environment for health, community wealth, and interaction including things like free Wi-Fi for the kids to sit next to the garden uh, and orchard, bringing back that legacy. Um, and so that's my part. Awesome. I uh, wanted to have a bit of a conversation between, between you two. Um, there's uh, obviously like as in uh, my work and your work, Justin, there's I think a lot of uh, common threads that could be uh, made between uh, your work and, and, and Jen's uh, point of entry and, and her work. Um, and one word, obviously, it's, it's sort of in the title of this segment uh, and in your, the name of your studio, uh, Jen, is uh, this idea of cooperative, which obviously like has, has obvious ties to cooperating. And so when I think of cooperating and, and the sort of sentiment, I guess, that animates cooperation, I think of trust. Um, and so you know, I, I would I would ask um, it, um, in the term of trust building, uh, what would you say uh, is I guess the role of the designer of the architect in um, in yeah in, in sort of fomenting the, this trust between people, between people and people, between people in the built environment, all all of the above. Mm -hmm. Good question. I mean, I think it goes back to Justin. Like, was it your first answer? Previous conversation of time. <laughs> Um, I think there is something to be said about, well, I guess also connecting to interrogating our design processes and what time that where we spend time in those in the process in our projects. When do we start initiatives right and what do we conceive as the start of something. Um, I, I find it that to be the biggest challenge as a designer, we want all the things to happen, but we want them to happen in like the nine month span that you know. <laughs> that report is due. 
Yeah. Yeah, I am. Um, uh, I showed in the, the kind of that old Flanner House research, there was uh, this, this work that they did to, to sort of to understand their full context. So they, they talked to all the different families. And I, I think kind of, you know, knowledge and understanding is, is really essential for trust building. Uh, and, and so, you know, we all live in a world where othering is kind of automatic mm -hmm. um, uh, in a way. And, and you know, whether in, in intended or not, it, it's just sort of something that we're, we're having to operate with. And so kind of acknowledging that, that there is that work that needs to be done to kind of understand what people's situations are and motivations are, uh, right? It, it comes up in community meetings all the time. Why didn't people come to a community meeting? It's like, well, they're taking care of five kids <laughs> or, uh, you know, the um, they've been to community meetings for, you know, years and they know it doesn't work out for them the same way that it works out for other people so they don't waste their time, right? And so that idea of trust building there is that kind of other work that needs to be done. And I, I think as, as designers, we have to um, uh, sort of be okay with that because it, it's this sort of difficult uh, thing. I'll paste in the chat later, but uh, Rhino Martin at Beale Center has put together this report on kind of how our industry is actually structured, right? So like our fees and our contracts and kind of what you can get paid for really drive a lot. And there's no kind of motivation, <laughs> right? To do some of this kind of care work or watering or things that are kind of constant and not based on, on uh, the interval as, as Jen was just mentioning. So I, I think that's something that I hope we can push conversations on and, and challenge not just how we're taught, we, you know, Carlton, you could do great studios and have change your courses and have all these young people kind of coming out with a different way. But then if they hit the wall, we've got to do the, the work simultaneously with uh, the professions. And I know there's a, a mixed audience here with, with some of the, the people from the design community to actually talk about that uh, so that we can build more sustainable ways uh, to do that. Yeah, that's great. Um... I mean, I think maybe just briefly do, uh, what would you say is the, uh, maybe the future or the state of trust, I guess, like in the, in the practice and, uh, and how we prioritize trust? Um, let's say in the short-ish term, next decade or two. Oh, man. Uh... <laughs> it's like, next question. Tough, tough one, Curry, geez. <laughs> You know, obviously technology is is transforming so much of this right now. Um, mm. uh, you know, the, the blue check mark and, you know, there there's just a lot in that question. Um, but I, I will say that kind of what we've been trying to do with, with BMU actually. So, you know, we didn't really kind of know each other other through than through kind of little pieces or kind of a fragment of a, of a thing. And kind of the, the work of kind of building and creating spaces for more connection and interaction, I, I think is, is kind of the infrastructure of trust, right? Are these sort of spaces of, of connection? And, and it's sort of a question, obviously we're all doing this virtually, but hopefully cross every finger you know, a year from now or two years from now, who, who knows, uh, right? We'll, we'll, there'll be some pull to go back to norm. And what does design have to contribute to that conversation, right? To keep some of the good things uh, that, that we've been able to accomplish, right? The, the, it sounds banal, but the design of a conference room has to radically change. <laughs> right? That's like true. Kind of yeah. bread, bread and butter of like a lot of firms is, you know, uh, kind of these kinds of, of spaces for meeting, right? That's one of the most basic things in architect designs is a place for people to meet. It has to change, like radically, right? And so like, we have to like, kind of be, be thinking of that uh, um, in our work. I would just add like a small note to that too. And I think it, it, it complements of, um, I think lang um, communication barriers and how as designers we are like using sort of our 
sort of faculties and skill sets to like break down communication barriers or um, like language liberation. I think because I I work in communities where like I look like them, but they know that I'm not them because I don't speak Chinese fluently and I don't and I have a very small knowledge and I'm from the West Coast, not the East Coast and for a myriad of reasons. So how do we and I think space and sort of designing things and having this boundary object to come around helps alleviate some amount of barriers because I, I work in civil essentially a civil rights organization a public history organization and they fundamentally don't do anything with place but they get it because it's something that we all you know understand and like feel right so we can talk about that sort of like a mural project together and that is a point of, of a connection that we can use those tools for. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think there's a, it seems that there's a, actually a lot of room for, I guess, optimism um, as far as we're concerned, right? And, and our sort of how we're positioning ourselves in the profession and our individual uh, practices. So um, do we, is that all the time we have for this segment? Yeah, I think that's all the time we have. We ran out okay. there, but, but thank you. Um, yeah so much and I, I think we're ready to uh, sort of open it up to thoughts and questions but first I definitely just want to thank uh, you Curry and, and Jen for doing it like it, this is an experiment that you all are, are part of right now uh, so uh, thank you and I, I really love seeing seeing your your work and ideas and, and having a, a conversation with you about it thanks for having us Thank you, Justin, Jen, Curry. A wonderful, a wonderful uh, presentation and series of conversations. We're starting to get some questions popping up already in the Q&A, uh, a couple from Graham Bristol and from Renee Kemp Rotan. Um, I would just like to say that if you would like to ask a question, you can certainly do that with the Q&A. Um, if you want to raise your hand, you can uh, you know, do that as well. We'll try to keep track of the hand raising and we can unmute perhaps if you'd like to ask your question. Um, we're, we're at about 8 p.m. here at least um, uh, on Eastern Standard Time. And so just want to be conscious of those that you know, might have uh, you know, evening plans and dinners and children and, and, uh, and other things. And so perhaps we can take about 10 or 15 minutes uh, and uh, you know, kind of ask some questions and uh, you know, have some folks respond in that way. And so um, as they start to come in, perhaps I can sort of feed them you know, to our uh, panelists here. Uh, Graham, you know, Graham Bristol has asked, uh, do you see your work as a continuation or expansion of Max Bond Jr.'s um, um, Architects Renewal Committee in Harlem, or do you see it as being distinct from that? Yeah, so um, within DMU, uh, this actually is, has come up um, a, a few times, and we actually, we have in our shared drive, we've got all the, the documents from the Bond archive uh, to see that work. And you know, sort of, uh, the, a lot of the bandwidth immediately went, uh, frankly, in orientation to the institution, right? To kind of uh, uh, directed a lot of the calls. There were sort of letters of of protest and demand from students, from faculty that were sort of institution focused. But within DMU, in a broader way, we are starting to think and, and talk about the, our orientation toward our real institutions, right, our communities, <laughs> uh, in, in a way, like in, in the broader way. Uh, and so uh, uh, we're doing uh, a course uh, with the facilitation of, of uh, the Van Allen Institute, where we're going to be working in community in Brooklyn and Gowanus uh, to, to do more direct community work that's more along the lines of, of, of what uh, the, the Bond generation was doing. Uh, but that is a reference that we know. Uh, and, and our sort of honoring in our work. But that work, uh, speaking of kind of what Jen just left off on with, with kind of trust and all that, that's work that's going to take time to sort of build that capacity uh, and, and relationships to do it right and to do it well and to not be uh, sort of landing. But uh, absolutely something we're, we're doing and interested in. Um, Graham, you know, Graham has another kind of follow-up sort of observation saying that he appreciated your comments, Justin, about storytelling and local uh, cultural producers uh, and makes a couple of references, one to John Forster talking about this in The Deliberative Practitioner and, uh, and Sherry Arnstein uh, talking about the ladder of citizen participation, Jen, with reference to your, you know, to your comments. 
Uh, and he observes, of course, that we're still working on this, and it would seem that we need to be exploring that more in the curriculum, I think, broadly speaking, which, uh, you know, I think wholeheartedly agree. I think, thank you, you know, thank you so much, Graham, you know, for those thoughts. Um, I see here on the chat also um, uh, a question or a comment by uh, Mustafa, um, you know, calling or uh, zooming in, chatting in from Buffalo, New York, where um, he writes, you referenced just in a non-traditional trajectory that you mapped out through your career and your family business. Uh, students and designers who are trying to pursue non-traditional or unconventional modes of practice often find themselves um, at the periphery of pro practice, sometimes by choice and sometimes not. As such, they can become distanced from the profession. It's in quotation marks, norms and um, other designers. And um, again, in quotation marks, the discourse in general. Um, how can we convince ourselves and our students that collectivity and cooperation and trust building, as Curry said, uh, and that all of these, um, 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 and that all that these entail um, uh, can be a serious ambition to those practitioners who find themselves on the margins by choice or not? Yeah, I'll start and I think Jen and Curry can, can jump in. So, you know, I'll, I'll be honest, the architecture didn't really love me, <laughs> right? Um, and I love architecture, but it, it didn't love me back enough uh, because it, I didn't frankly have certain opportunities and, and, and things that other people were afforded. Uh, I'd like to think I'm a pretty talented person and all of that, but I just simply didn't, still didn't have a pathway um, uh, uh, to that work. And so I sort of figured out pretty early on, actually, that I, I did need to kind of grow and find other uh, modes of work and interest in that uh, collective work was a, a, a great path for uh, opportunity and, and success. So, you know, because I've worked in government and worked in collectives and then, you know, do sort of a, a side business and all of that uh, has sort of built the, the sort of value and, and agency that I have because I do a lot of different things, right? Um, and that, that is a type of, of design. So, you know, you probably would have read a lot about someone like Rem Koolhaas who does the same thing, but Rem Koolhaas gets to do buildings in the way that architect traditionally gets to do for a lot of different reasons. Uh, but but that sort of idea of sort of expanding practice and the, the richness and the, the kind of the energy it provides is great. Um, I don't know if Curry or Jen have, have thoughts yeah, on that. You know, I, mean, I encourage it. I encourage people to do a lot of things. Yeah, I mean, I think going back to uh, one of the, the uh, points you made earlier was, you know, uh, when you were talking about the conference room and how that has to radically change, right? And I think the practice, the profession has to radically change so that um, you know, the, the, you know, the people that kind of want to do all the things, people like you and I who have the circuitous kind of, uh, career paths, um, are, um, or that can be as much, you know, that can be easily, uh, the rule, but not so much the, the exception. Um, you know, my first, first project out of school was on working on a massive stormwater management project just as a CAD drafter. Um, and, you know, now I'm sort of teaching, doing this, what I call the cocktail, the teaching, consulting, commission work kind of amalgam. And, and I think um, that is still, I mean, part of it is just, um, um, you know, taking, uh, taking the time to acknowledge that that kind of practice is still practice. You're still a practitioner. Um, and, and it, you know, it's okay to call yourself, I think, even in that context, a uh, sort of architect, you know, or, or um, I think that these terms that we tend to capitalize, right? Capital A architect, um, you know, I think kind of beginning to uh, uh, um, just in the profession, challenging the profession either through your work and, and even more overtly and explicitly um, kind of just like uh, destabilizing those, those kind of prevailing attitudes, I think. Um, I think that all of that goes in the, in the uh, is, is, um, is important. I mean, I think as it pertains to school, um, I had a similar experience in school where, you know, I think probably about the third year I was like, uh, I knew I either wanted to design like really small things, like I wanted to be like an industrial product designer, or I wanted to design really large things like, you know, uh, parks and, and streetscapes, like uh, urban designer. Um, but something about the scale of architecture as it what decided, was sort of um, decreasing in interest actually for me. 
Um, and so that was controversial in school actually. And so it took me really in the last few years for me to realize that that was uh, what I was doing was okay. So, you know, I, I think um, the, the, ins the educational institutions in addition to the profession, I think have a role in, in sort of diversifying how we think about the built environment and who, which, which, uh, who is, um, you know, who has a role in shaping that. Yeah, I feel like the educational culture is really important. Um, it took me 12 years to go back to graduate school. So going to open houses, um, and I would have to say, I definitely applied to and got into a couple of the major players in landscape architecture graduate programs, but they were huge red flags to me because the one the one studio they hated, all of them despise, was their group project, the studio. <laughs> And they all saw it in the same way. It was like, we get through the semester and then we can move on to do our own work. And I'm like, I can't, I don't have spent time for this. I'm almost 40. I can't do this. <laughs> like, I spent 12 years trying to learn how to work together with people. So like I, I went into a program in MDES where it was two years and one half of the first year, you have to move together. We were a, a cohort of five women. And it was hard and we weren't as productive. And uh, some of our, like, you know, our deliverables or products were different in that first year because it was a messy experience. Working together, working as a unit and trying to define what collectivity is between five individuals that had, were total strangers before and total different backgrounds. So, um, but I gained so much more from that experience uh, in that two years um, that has some sort of much more sustainable, I think, uh, yeah a model moving forward. So it's a wonderful observation, Jen. Um, I'm reminded of, of an experience that I had at the University of Minnesota where we worked for five years on a collaborative graduate design studio with landscape architects, urban and regional planners um, and architects and about, um, in the end, um, over five years, about 40 uh, you know, public and private stakeholders in the city of Duluth. And it was um, you know, one of the most rewarding experiences, I think, as a teacher that I've ever had. Uh, you know, this amazing kind of collaboration that not only lasted over a term, but over five years in the end, and it was remarkable, uh, wonderful, uh, uh, um, a really important question. You know, group projects are amazing. Um, quick, uh, a quick question here from Vicki Howell. Well, maybe not a quick question, but a great question from Vicki Howell. She's writing in from MOVE, from the Gulf Coast Community Development Corporation. Uh, and she writes that um, Africatown was known as a self-sustaining community, much like the Flanner House, except it was built by actual Africans who had been illegally brought to Mobile, Alabama. Um, how do we recapture that spirit of self-sufficiency, especially food ways, and use design and architecture to bring that back and revitalize a 19th century community for the 21st century space of black joy and connection to Africa? And I'll, I'll quickly say the, the four with and, and uh, the cooperative studios, I, I think, are, are there to exactly take that on. Uh, you know, I, I, I do think we, you know, obviously you can kind of look at and adapt and replicate uh, the work. And there's what I call kind of archive work that needs to be done uh, to, to sort of learn and, and kind of recover some of those histories and find out what we can. Uh, Dr. Andrea Roberts' Texas Freedom Colonies project, for example, uh, comes to mind, uh, and, and there's a lot of great work happening that we first need to do to actually kind of secure our archive of, of ideas and, and work and histories that have been uh, either erased or marginalized. Uh, so that's sort of like step one, actually, uh, is to do that and, and to start sharing it so that we understand that connectedness and, and collectivity uh, of, of those experiences uh, and including the connections to, to Africa. Um, but then I, I think it, it's by sort of starting the work, right? And when we did Urban Patch, and I, I, won't, I didn't go into it, but like it was like all the racism still existed, right? When, I, when we bought the first house, because it's in a black neighborhood, it wouldn't appraise for enough money to get bank financing to do a renovation, yet white people that are gentrifiers seem to be able to make it work with getting bank financing all the time because redlining still basically exists, right? So there, there are a, a lot of challenges that you still have to uh, kind of work through, but things like design schools doing studios to have people generating creative ways 
uh, to think about these questions, to visualize it, right? That's work that you can be in conversation and dialogue with and then go to your community and say, well, what of this is, is of interest? Can we actually do it? You can get grants, you can do SUSUs and pull money, you can do crowdfunding. There, there are a lot of things, but you just have to just start it, right? So Urban Patch started with that little vacant house that cost $30,000. Uh, today, it's over a million dollars of property in, in, in Urban Patch's portfolio, right? Uh, and you just have, it just had to start by starting. That's wonderful. Um, Mustafa notes that he doesn't have a question, but he wanted to thank you all for your thoughtful answers. Uh, it's wonderful. Um, we're, we're kind of coming up towards the end of, uh, of our session, and uh, there's one more kind of thought from Braden Gray. Perhaps we can use that as a way to sort of cap our evening. Um, he writes here, in the architectural profession, clients are such an important factor in terms of the scope of a project, the inclusion of elements that allow for the creation of cooperatives and the building of community trust. How do some of these concepts of inclusion translate into the explanatory process with clients? How do we communicate these things with clients in that way? Um, turn it over to our panelists. Um, I'm multitasking. One second. I'm going to put some, a couple links in the chat. Um, uh, the Buell Center report that I, I mentioned, it talks about kind of the, the, the industry. Uh, and then the other um, kind of thing that I'll say is that the, the idea of the client is, <laughs> is something that we actually do have to, to sort of to challenge uh, because typically the client is a certain type of person or even entity when you look at the control and the power dynamics. Uh, and so, I, you know, I think there are difficult conversations about our ethics of practice in the architecture field that need to challenge and push back on, on the sort of the dynamics of the client. So in that work, I think actually architects are the client for what are we going to do about that collectively to, to provide more empowerment for uh, how we, we practice. Um, and then, you know, relative to kind of community trust, um, you know, I, I think there are, uh, you know, we, we talked about it already, like there are ways to think about inclusion and connectivity. Um, there's a really interesting uh, organization called NICO, Neighborhood Investment Company, and it's a, a REIT, a real estate investment trust uh, model that uh, uh, essentially is based on having community ownership that isn't necessarily like a community land trust and typical model. It, it's still a REIT, it's still a corporate entity, but in the governance of that entity through having something like a benefit corp, there's sort of a different weight of shares and power for someone that actually lives in a project versus someone who's an outside investor, right? And so there are kind of broader sort of questions about ownership and control, uh, maintenance, stewardship, et cetera, et cetera, that are being kind of simultaneously in this moment challenged uh, that, that architects might want to start paying attention to some of that uh, stuff because hopefully it sort of grows uh, uh, and develops. But I'm gonna finish putting the link in the chat, one second. <laughs> I don't know if Jen or Curry had responses to that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of extending uh, even some of the conversation from, I think, maybe the last question we were talking about uh, sort of transdisciplinary practice. Um, and, you know, just kind of even thinking about um, maybe even expanding our idea of the client outside of this sort of narrow single party uh, as being the client, right? Like in, in sort of like if a developer, a developer, you know, approaches an architect um, for a project that he wants to, de to deliver, um, in that, in that sort of, uh, in that transaction, uh, which is actually hyper transactional, right? Um, the client is the developer when in fact the client should also, the idea of the client, I think should also be extended to the people that that building is serving or, or you know, or the community that, that building is serving. Um, and so I don't know what that mechanism looks like. Um, but, uh, I, I think, um, yeah, I, I think when you can begin to kind of uh, you know, think about the collective, right? All the people that are sort of affected by the, the built work. Um, I think you can kind of get to some of these issues that maybe Justin is bringing up, um, you know, so we can kind of get to uh, maybe uh, these sort of built works that aren't necessarily oppressive or, or 
um, or depressive. <laughs> Depressing. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you, thank you, Curry. Uh, uh, Graham has, you know, perhaps a final comment uh, where he says, "I couldn't help but connect to your comments about the inadequacy, uh, excuse me, the inadequacies of the architecture curriculum," uh, and he had much the same experience. He's grateful to hear about individual experiences uh, in overcoming these inadequacies. Still, it seems to call for some significant changes to the NAAB standards, as well as institutional AIA, and here in Canada, you know, with uh, you know, with the OAA and provincial bodies. Um, um, and their understandings of practice. Uh, and, um, you know, Mustafa agrees and says DMU for faculty, which would be wonderful and why we're so grateful that we have DMU for faculty this year here at, uh, at Carleton. Um, you know, with that, I think we'll, we'll probably wrap our evening. Thank you so much to all of the attendees uh, and our special and grateful thanks to Justin, to Jen and to Curry for their time and their words and their efforts with us and our students. Uh, we're delighted to have you here with us at Carlton and are um, looking forward to when we can uh, welcome you back physically into our amazing building here on campus and hopefully that will be soon. Uh, thank you all so much. Um, have a, um, a wonderful evening um, and we'll see you at our next lecture series, hopefully, with uh, Christopher Cornelius and Leslie Kern and Mabel Wilson. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Take thank care. You. Great. Thanks so much. Wonderful. Justin, Jen, Curry, thank you guys so much. Uh, wonderful, wonderful evening. Um, I will follow up with you or Gabrielle or others will follow up with you about all of the kind of post-lecture things. 